Hello, and welcome to The Point. I'm Marcel Weider. On today's episode, it's been nine months since Patrick Brown took the helm of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party. We talk with Conservative strategist John Capobianco on the recent party meeting in Ottawa. And former Justice Minister Erwin Kotler is being honoured for his decades as a progressive thinker in political and legal circles. Sandra Pupitello is co-chair of the tribute that will see money raised from the evening going to the Pearson Centre for Progressive Policy. All that and more on this edition of The Point. John Capobianco has served as a political strategist to several political leaders and has run as a candidate himself. John, thanks so much for joining us today. Good to be here, Marcel. Thank you for asking. So the Ontario PC Party, after nine months, has had its annual general meeting just in Ottawa recently. Tell me a little bit about how that went. Well, you know what, I, I got to say, I was a delegate at the convention. I've been a delegate at almost every convention since I was 18 years old. So. Um, and this one here had a sort of feel of excitement, uh, ref of renewal. And I think every new leader that gets elected uh, and selected by the party members, I think their first convention is always a big one. It's a lot of, lot of you know, uh, bent up, uh, bent up uh, um, uh, excitement and enthusiasm. And I think Patrick handled it well. It was a really good convention. There was a lot of delegates. We had a lot of people that were there as observers. But more importantly, I think that convention served... Uh, for Patrick as a way to put his stamp on the party, and that's what we so saw. So are we seeing a new progressive conservative party? Well, we, you know, the, the provincial party kept the name progressive conservative for that reason. I think they wanted to it remain was all progressive in and but conservative. name in the but, last uh, number of years. Well, and I guess every leader has their opportunity to kind of rebrand and re remake the party, as we saw with Patrick this, this coming election. He, I thought, did a great job in, in sort of with the new logo and the new uh, messaging, and uh, we had a new executive elected. So it was a lot of refresh and renewal, I think, that came out of this convention. And a lot of people, me included, and I've been a longtime conservative, found it to be actually quite enthusiastic and quite, quite nice. It was, a, it was a good convention. Now, when... Patrick Brown was an MP under Stephen Harper. That was a real conservative government. And now it seems like he's cast aside his past affiliation, an irony that it happened to be in Ottawa, with the, with the federal conservative party, and he's now tacking to a, a more progressive. For example, he's open to carbon pricing, which was absolutely verboten during the Harper regime. Well, I think Patrick's making the transition from being a backbench MP in a government that was led by Stephen Harper to now being a leader of a provincial party. And there's a lot of differences, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a huge amount of differences. And one, is, one now is that he actually can make and develop policies, whereas with, when he was a backbencher in, in the Stephen Harper government, he literally had to you know, abide by what was happening at the cabinet level and at the PMO. But now what you're seeing is Patrick taking his experiences as an MP and actually developing his own leadership style and his own way of, of being able to, to uh, you know, bring policies together that he feels uh, is what Ontario needs. Because remember, as an MP from Barrie in Ottawa, he represents not only Barrie, but he represents interests for across Canada. Here, he's specifically looking at int uh, interests of Ontarians, and he sees so, the environment as a significant issue in Ontario. Well, that, that's interesting to note, but the fact is is that he really hasn't come out with any policies. Even at the Ottawa speech, where a lot of people were hoping he talked talk about policy, it was very light. In fact, you know, some people have said that he's, uh, you know, it's Conservative Party light. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you've seen, uh, and he's only been a leader now for, you know, just, just over a year, and, and, and in that year, he's done a lot. He's got himself elected. Uh, sooner than most pundits and most media thought he would, he got himself elected as, as, a, as an MPP. In a very uh, safe seat, albeit. But nonetheless, nothing's really safe these days, as you know, Marcel. But, but nonetheless, he did, and he was able to do that in a very, in a very smooth fashion. But he got himself elected, and he had a by-election uh, where the, in, the person that got elected, Lauren Coe, 
won uh, the popular vote more so than a very popular Christine Elliott did before him. So he's done a lot of good things. And he's also came up, came, uh, come up with some very strong policies. He's obviously going against the, the hydro sale. And at the convention, he actually in, unveiled a very comprehensive de policy development process because one of the things that Patrick wants to do is he wants to develop policy from the ground up and not from the top, top down. And I think that's refreshing. But that's, that's exactly what Tim Hudak said many conventions ago. I remember, you know, watching that. And, you know, Hudak made a big deal about having grassroots participation and policy development from the, the bottom up. And then what happened in, during the election? It was all top down. Well, and I think a lot of party members uh, learn from their mistakes. Uh, and I know that Patrick, who was on the sidelines as an MP watching it, um, but he ran he as. Sitting, he was standing right beside Tim Hudak when he announced the 100,000 staff cut that he proposed. Well, because Tim was in his writing actually s suggesting it. So, of course, as a, as a loyal conservative person, Patrick was there to do that. But, mm -hmm. but what's important, though, is now that he's leader, now that he's been elected leader, now that he's actually putting a stamp on his party, Marcel, the key thing now is that he's developing his own way of doing things that is actually very much an invo involves the party. And if you were at the convention, as I was, we saw a really comprehensive policy development process that really is uh, a, a grassroots up movement uh, that he wants to be able to engage in the next year to two to three years. And I think what you'll see come election in 2018 is a policy document or an election document that will be driven by the policies created by party members. I think that's a big change and that's going to be well, refreshing. Let me talk to you about the grassroots, about your, your membership. They tend to be a little more conservative than, than the leader or the party. In fact, I, I would say that they somewhat mirror what's happening in the Republican Party. You know, the, the Republican Party is tending to tack violently to the right with Cruz and Trump and, uh, to some extent, Rubio. You know, they're going to the right. Is the, is the grassroots going to attack to the right uh, to mirror what's happening in the states? Well, I think it's a challenge with sort of all political parties, really. And I think ours... Uh, is no different. I think when you've got various, you know, segments or factions of conservatives, and as well as the liberals do, and and even more so, the, the NDP uh, have their factions of 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 left-leaning um, uh, members. We're no different. And I think the the key for any successful leader, as we've seen over the course of years, is to be able to sort of come in there with a, a strong sense of where he or she wants to see the province go and how they think the party needs to do needs to get to get there to actually win the election. And I think what Patrick has done is he is looking at all various issues in the policies. He wants the, pol the public, the, the, the party membership and others to come up with the policy. Uh, and he'll determine with others and in, 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 in his caucus uh, the best way forward. But I think that he's, he's actually tapping into every section of the conservative membership in a very successful way because he won. And I could tell you, because I, you know, I worked uh, for, uh, for his opponent, but I could tell you as a big supporter of Patrick now and always have been uh, of the party, uh, he's doing a great job tapping into all of those segments of conservatives. And he might, will, he, will he disappoint some? Sure, every leader does in some cases, but what is more important is if you listen to your membership and if you want to believe that they've got the right answers, then you will always get them on side. And Patrick is certainly on the right path in that regard. So your party is in debt over $5 million. How are you going to get out of that hole? Well, we're, we, you know, the, this, this coming weekend, this weekend pass was a good way of, of being able to do that. I think our donors and, and people who wish to, to, the, the Conservative Party to succeed are seeing a strong, principled leader in Patrick Brown. They're seeing the caucus rallying behind him. They're seeing, you know, over 2,000 members of, of the party uh, show up at a convention in Ottawa, um, uh, you know, enthusiastically supporting our leader. Those are all signs that are going to help us with fundraising. And I think, um, you know, Patrick is well aware he's always been a strong fundraiser, but he's also reaching out to other untraditional members of, of the Conservative Party to, to bring them in and, and get money as well. So I think you'll see that we'll be, uh, we'll be in financially good shape. But after every election, as you know, Marcel, um, parties are always in debt. And, and it's a question of how quickly you can get yourself out of debt. And Patrick is well aware, as we all are, and we as party members and supporters will do our part to help raise the money. But now, there's some million, controversy in one of these uh, fundraising efforts where you're actually selling access in the members' lounge at Queen's Park. Well, if I'm not mistaken, I believe I read something about the Liberal Party and, and some, some firm is, is, is hosting a $6,000 dinner with ministers. They, but they're not using the people's place, the legislature, 
to do their fundraising. In. Right. They're doing it at a private uh, uh, hotel where they've paid for that. You're proposing allowing people who pay $5,000 over three years access into the members' lounge. Well, I think, I think Queen's Park, in my, if I'm not mistaken, is access to open to all the public, quite frankly. Uh, but not myself. at a price. You're putting well, a price on it. But, it. but it's also a choice. It's a choice if somebody wants What's to go. What's the choice? The well, choice is if you pay up, you can get into the members' lounge. But it's, it's not a, normally accessible to the public. But it's no different, I think, Marcel, than any other political party that charges an exorbitant amount of money to have access to a minister or well, to a Well, your party, party's done it in, in, under the Harris days. And but, it's, but we're in opposition, though, so the good news well, is that... I, it's, I know it's, that I'll be at one of your <laughs> fundraisers tomorrow night, you know. One of my personal fundraisers. Well, not yours, but yeah. one of your party members. No, but I do think, though, to your point, though, I think... You know, it, it's an important aspect, and, and, and I'm in the, in, the, in the government relations business. I think it's an important aspect to know that, um, you know, there's always open and, and transparent access. I think that's the key thing to any of these things. So, so even... Not arguing you know, with that, but I I'm, think that having a fundraising by using the legislature... That really crosses the line. It's it's well, not even close to the line. I think it's well past the line. I think I think well, you know, Marcel, and I think that's an opinion that you certainly you know have, and and, and you is your right to have. But I also think that it isn't any different than any other you know uh, party who has a five hundred or a thousand or a six thousand in the case of of the liberal government. Where, but you know, and I think it's actually more telling when you know they're actually having uh, a fundraiser with with a minister or the premier who are in the decision making process versus an opposition leader who you know people just want to get to know and want to get to meet so but i as i'm not against fundraising either from a liberal perspective or NDP perspective i think it's part of the public policy process um, so i think it's all in the same kind of milieu but um, you know, at the end of the day, people have a choice to buy a ticket to go visit somebody and see somebody, and and no one's going to be influenced by you know by somebody who's well, going to buy somebody a who's giving five thousand dollars and getting access to uh, the uh, west lobby. I, I think that's something that's uh, uh, or sorry, the east lobby is something that's a lot. It will different. be the west lobby well, in twenty eighteen, Marcel. Possibly, <laughs> we'll, we'll wait to see. But let me ask you another area of uh, concern is about. Patrick had the least number of caucus members supporting him. And now we see that there's a fight between two caucus members in redistribution in a seat in the Ottawa area yeah. between uh, Jack McLaren and Lisa McLeod. And it's not proving to go away. And it's a, it's a source of uh, bitterness among those uh, supporters of each particular MPP. Yeah, and, and that's, I think, something that, you know, whenever redistribution happens... We see uh, time and time again at the federal level, at the provincial level, federally when we went through redistribution, um, you know, a lot of, you know, incumbents were unfortunately faced to have to fight for a writing. Um, we saw it with the, the opposition at the time, the liberals, and we saw it with the government, uh, with the conservatives, where we had two good MPs uh, fighting against each other because they had to fight for one seat. It's part of the democratic process, and I think the key thing is... Uh, to allow the members to make the choice. At the end of the day, they, like anybody else, and I ran for office, and I know that you know it's all about membership and, and, and nomination meetings. And I think what happens is the people will get it right. Uh, you know, if it is Lisa and Jack McLaren fighting for one riding, they're both going to have to sell memberships, and, and whoever gets the most members wins. And I think that's a fair process. John, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Up next, the Pearson Center's Pursuing Justice Project. Increasingly, politicians have been employing the politics of division. While it backfired on Stephen Harper in the federal election, we're seeing it work to Trump's advantage in the U.S. As Canada continues to become more diverse, nonprofit the Pearson Center is encouraging Canadians to engage in dialogue about social and economic issues related to public policy. Here to speak about their latest undertaking, the Pursuing Justice Project, is former cabinet minister and event co-chair Sandra Pupitello. Nice to see you, Marcel. Thanks so much for joining us. Sandra, tell us about the Pearson Center and what its objectives are. Well, the, you know, there are a lot of think tanks out there, and that is groups, nonprofit organizations that do this public policy development. But there aren't any in the middle of the political spectrum. You hear all about the 
right wing type and the left wing type. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted one that's in the center. And the reason I was drawn to the Pearson Center is it is one that is prepared to discuss economic matters. It's prepared to talk about the economy. And that's really important for this current government, for sure, and any government that truly is centrist, which, in my view, most of the time they start mm -hmm. a little extreme and they become centrist as they continue to govern. So a think tank really should be dedicating a thought process. How do you inform government from the center of the political spectrum on any number of issues, including the economy, which is always front and center mm -hmm. these days, and in this instant, pursuing justice, which is very critical, very timely. Mm -hmm. And we thought that because we're all talking about it, the Commission on Aboriginal and Human Rights, that's been going on for some time, we've got to move to the next step now. So what better way to raise money for the, the Pearson Center than by holding a fundraiser that fets and tr pays a tribute to Erwin Kotler, who is very well known in this space. So we raise money. Former Justice Minister, former I should Former Justice add. Min Minister, that's right. Federally. Federal Minister. And uh, so you know all about this, and we're delighted to have you participating in this event. It's going to be a great event on March 31st, right here in downtown Toronto. We're bringing all the bells and whistles. We like to think all the serious players uh, from both federal and provincial environments, government, mm -hmm. former ministers, uh, provincial and federal. Um, we have four honorary co-chairs that are our former prime ministers across the political spectrum. So it isn't a partisan event at all. So the uh, Pearson Center, I should point out, is federally mandated. It's, it's based in Ottawa. It is. The center is based in Ottawa, but our work really involves provincial governments and mm -hmm. federal. So depending on the topic, in this instant where we're using just a, the, our former minister, Erwin Kotler, as the tributee, if you will, to raise money, to give to the center, part of their work will be on this right. Pursuing Justice project, which means actually informing government by way of good public policy development on the issue of justice, how to move to that next level. Usually governments, they, they sort of put out their policy pieces at 30,000 feet. The real work is when you get into the weeds of public policy development, what can work, where you have to bring stakeholders together. Mm -hmm. As a nonpartisan third party, it's a lot easier to speak quite openly and honestly in that kind of a forum, which is what this Pearson Center will offer, and we'll be able to offer that to the government when it's done. Um, it will start rolling out these discussion papers and opportunities to talk about those details when it comes to justice for both provincial and federal governments. So we've seen several other think tanks, and you mentioned there's on the left and on the right. right. They produce these different reports that then get circulated mm -hmm. in the media mm -hmm. and in government. They testify before committees and commissions, and they... Mm -hmm ramp up their policy perspective. There really hasn't till now been somewhere in the progressive center as I'd like to describe it. Right, right. That's a good word for it, progressive center. Um, so on, let me give you an example. We just held an event with our industry minister, Navdeep Baines, Economies of Tomorrow. The whole point is everybody's talking about innovation, but how do you get to the detail? What does that mean from a government policy perspective? What regulation? What incentive? Mm -hmm. What kind of tax policy? That's the kind of detail that if you just sort of throw it at the government and say, here, go be more innovative. Mm -hmm. They say, really, well, what? What actually works? We're the ones that are now coming to the table with people who work in the industry to say to government, here's some good public policy development on very specific things that a government can do provincially and federally to move the, the needle on being an innovative economy. And that, to me, is... It's timely, it's exciting, is a good way to be involved in, frankly, the, the, the prosperity for the nation. So what type of people or organizations would participate in developing this policy process? Well, we, in our position as a centrist think tank, we would really reach out and make sure from the center of the political spectrum, we're not going to have sort of the, the, the extreme opinions, we really are going to focus the work and mean bring voices across the spectrum but focus our efforts and our results and what we want to offer to government from a centrist perspective. So would you bring business and labor people together? Them. Would and you it, bring yeah. in uh, people on the social policy side, uh, advocates well, I think on being, the and environment? Being in the middle, when you're in the center, mm -hmm. it means you really do listen to them all. You're not 
all driven by the left or socialist perspective. You're not all driven from the right and only a corporate tax policy perspective. You're trying to bring it all together from a centrist perspective. If, if somebody wanted to get involved, has a mm -hmm. great idea that the center should pursue, mm -hmm. Are they invited to they, Everyone is, be and, involved, I think, and I think some people are doing that now. They're saying, geez, I haven't heard of this yet, because let's face it, we're in our, our second year, so it's a fledgling in that it's new. Mm -hmm. Some very high-powered high people that are quite involved, though, not just on fundraising, but also in the policy discussions we're having. And I'd like to tell everyone how involved you are yeah. in this center, um, because I think we both yeah. recognize where we came from. That was a missing voice from the middle mm -hmm. of that spectrum that's needed here. I was delighted because finally we could take a centrist position and talk about the economy. Uh, we all know that that is the key right now on how we're going to, how, how do you meet out programs no matter what the spectrum if you don't have any money, if, you're, if your economy isn't flourishing. So I'm delighted. I, we, we've got so, some really good things on the go here. So let's, let's focus in on the event that's coming up mm -hmm. on March the 31st. And what is the, the outcome of that event? What is the, the money going to be used for? How is mm -hmm. it uh, going to develop? And how can people get, uh, if they want to come to the event, I understand yeah. there's tickets available. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way is to go to the pearsoncenter.ca and you'll see the link right on the front, right on the front of the website to, to find a way to come to our function. Downtown Toronto on the 31st of March at the King Edward Hotel. And th that networking portion begins right at 5.30. Mm -hmm. We go into the actual discussion with Erwin Kotler, and that's going to be hosted first by our Justice Minister for Ontario, Madeleine Mayer. We're delighted she's participating. And Indira Naidu is also going to be there as part of that discussion mm -hmm. with Erwin Kotler. Many might know that he's a former MP from the Montreal area, former Justice Minister appointed under Paul Martin. Mm -hmm. And even preceding all of that, he was one of the lawyers that worked with Nelson Mandela back in the day when he was freed. It's like a long history of serving justice in the world, not just in Canada. So, Senator, what are the broad areas that the Pursuing Justice Project will focus on? Well, there will be a number of sessions that will come across this year. Each one of them will have a different focus of, of debate or topic discussion where you get into the details. The Aboriginal file, the outcome of the commission, for example, how do you get government moving to the next step now? What kinds of change would be required to, to, uh, to input those recommendations, for example? Youth and justice, and, and what are those issues around mm -hmm. youth and justice today, and how do governments grapple with that? A lot of that could be provincial as well and provincial input required. Uh, Anti-Semitism, racism, all of these are areas where they, they sort of are flaring up as a topic every now and then, every time you have an incident. What is government's role in taking that forward? And what about the rest of us? Sandra, looking forward to seeing you on March the 31st at the King Edward Hotel in honor of Erwin Kotler. And if anyone else is interested, uh, again, the website is? PearsonCenter.ca. I feel like we're doing a commercial here. We are. So just go on to our website, the PearsonCenter.ca. Uh, send us some great ideas uh, on the policy front. Uh, but for this event, uh, we hope that it's a spectacular success. It'll be a great tribute to a great man. Sandra Pupatello is the event co-chair for the Pearson Center's Pursuing Justice Project. We'll be back with The Point. In less than six months, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has arguably been involved in more international travel than his predecessor, Stephen Harper, during his first term. Some may argue that these foreign adventures do not yield any benefit for Canada. I, on the other hand, say they are extremely important and beneficial. Trade and diplomacy are in many ways dependent on personal relationships. The better and stronger our leaders' relationship is with a foreign government, the more opportunity Canadian businesses have to succeed and the more influence we wield on the international stage. Which brings us to the recent visit to Washington by Justin Trudeau. While President Obama is in the twilight of his presidency, there is no doubt that the Prime Minister's visit will strengthen the Canada-U.S. relationship. It was also an opportunity for the Washington elites and power brokers to view up close the new Canadian PM. 
And finally, it served to contrast the U.S. presidential sideshow with a breath of fresh northern air. But international travel is not the only travel that the Prime Minister has been doing lately. After a seven-year hiatus, the Prime Minister sat down with the Premiers in Vancouver recently and came away with a framework on carbon pricing. Meeting face-to-face -face can open doors, settle issues, and create new opportunities. I hope our Prime Minister and other leaders understand the value of developing and strengthening personal relationships that benefit our country, province, and city. And that's the point. That's all for this edition of The Point. Keep up with the show and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like us on Facebook. And follow us on Twitter, at The Point TV. Thank you for watching. I'm Marcel Weider. Join me again next time on The Point.